Good morning to those in Asia, good afternoon or evening to those in North America. My name is Stephanie Chang. I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to join the symposium. In my presentation, I'll be addressing the topic of linking infrastructure and community resilience by focusing on regional transportation systems. I'd like to start with this figure, which comes from the concept note that Craig Davis and many others have been working on. Within this overall infrastructure resilience framework, I was asked to speak to one portion of the diagram, specifically to consider element three, system service provision and operability, its relationship with element four, continuity of services temporarily lost, and how these relate to elements five and six, social and economic activity and community well-being. I mentioned that I would be talking about regional transportation systems, and you might ask, why? And indeed, in the literature on infrastructure resilience, while there is a lot of emphasis on infrastructure systems, such as electric power or water, within cities, there's very little discussion of infrastructure that connects cities. But I maintain that there are situations where it is really important to consider the resilience of transportation systems that connect towns and cities, especially where regional transport networks have low redundancy, such as in mountainous areas, or when considering hazard events that affect a very broad geographic region, for example, a subduction zone earthquake. So what I would like to do in this presentation is to take the infrastructure resilience framework and ask two questions. First, how well do the key concepts in the framework apply to regional transportation systems? I'll focus on the concepts of socio-technical system, system services provision and operability, and continuity of services temporarily lost. And second, how can we assess the impact of service disruption on social and economic activity and community well-being? Let me introduce a case study to ground this discussion and make it more tangible. The case study is the coastal region of British Columbia on the Pacific coast of Canada. We have seismicity here from subduction zone earthquakes, as well as deep intraplate and crustal earthquakes. The region includes not only the Vancouver metropolitan region, but also many coastal and island towns and cities, including the provincial capital of Victoria that's situated on Vancouver Island. We have the Port of Vancouver, which is the largest port in the country for imports and exports. And for regional transportation, we also have a network for coastal shipping. Marine transportation is an important lifeline here for the transport of people as well as goods. For example, the provincial capital of Victoria receives 90% of its food supply via marine transportation. And this regional transportation system is not very redundant. So let's consider how well the key concepts from the infrastructure resilience framework apply to this regional marine transport system. Or on the other hand, Perhaps there are aspects that don't quite fit the framework and that might require special consideration. So first, is the regional marine transportation system a socio-technical system? Clearly, yes, and in interesting ways. Some elements of the system are technical, physical infrastructure, such as ports or even ships. But in order to understand how the system works, we also need to understand the socio part of the system everything from the designation of routes that connect the ports to the specialized labor that runs the ships to regulations that govern marine transport operations. For example, safety regulations prevent a ferry from carrying both passengers and dangerous goods at the same time. So dangerous goods, such as chemicals or fuel, must be transported on a separate sailing. Another way to think about this is that the regional marine transportation system could be disrupted in many different ways. The disruption source could be physical damage, such as in an earthquake, or it could be on the social side, such as a labor strike by dock workers that stops the system from functioning, even though the physical infrastructure is completely intact. So the idea of the socio-technical system fits, but I think there are some caveats. By this, I mean that regional transport systems are different from urban infrastructure, such as potable water or electricity, in some key ways. I think the boundaries of the system are much more difficult to establish geographically, organizationally, and in terms of interdependent transportation modes. The number of parties involved are also much more numerous and diverse, 
than, say, for a water system. Uh, there are the port authorities, the shipping companies, and the government regulators, for example. The entities providing the physical infrastructure are often not the entities who are using the physical infrastructure. And it's important to recognize that the various transport companies are competing against one another, which influences how the network is used. So what about system services provision and operability? At some level, the concept is certainly applicable. We can think of services in terms of network connectivity, route capacity, schedules, transport flows, and so on. So we can think of reductions in system services in terms of reductions in network connectivity, transport flows, etc. But again, there are caveats. It's important to distinguish between the transport of goods versus the transport of people. Unlike, say, a potable water system, there are many types of goods being transported by the infrastructure system, and actually they often use different parts of the overall network. On the marine side, the transport network for fuel, for example, is quite distinct from the transport network for food. So in a post-disaster situation, if the regional marine transport system is, say, 50% restored, that could mean that food supply has been fully restored, but fuel supply is still very restricted. And conceptually, I think it's even more complicated when we talk about transportation of people across this regional network. The demand for mobility is very different from the demand for consumption, say, of water or electricity. And of course, there are many behavioral aspects that complicate the demand for mobility in a disaster situation. And finally, in terms of continuity of services temporarily lost, I think this is a very useful concept in relation to transportation systems. With marine transportation, it's possible to maintain transport network connectivity through alternate routes that get around a damaged area or alternate modes such as air, rail, or road, at least to some degree. This does differ depending on whether we're talking about goods or people and also what kinds of goods. For example, if ships are not operating, you can move people by airplane but not large quantities of gasoline by airplane. It's interesting that one resilience aspect related to transportation is the possibility that people can stockpile goods as a preparedness measure. So if people stored two weeks worth of food at home instead of three days worth, that could reduce the demand on the regional transport network in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Also, it's possible to prioritize what goods are transported and as we know, the demand for travel is much more flexible than the, than the demand for, say, potable water. So overall, broadly, I think a regional marine transport system can be thought of similarly to other infrastructure systems, except there are some important special considerations. With all this in mind, then, how can we assess the impact of service disruption? This was the question that my collaborators and I addressed in a recent project entitled Strategic Planning for Coastal Community Resilience, or SIREN. Our objective was to help build resilience of marine transportation systems and the coastal communities that rely on them for the same case study region. We focused on preparing for the emergency response phase of a disaster. And you can see that although our approach involved developing models and assessments for this case study, we also put a lot of emphasis on engaging with the stakeholders or organizations involved in this infrastructure system. We held five workshops, or actually four, as the last one was canceled due to COVID, in which we involved over 30 organizations uh, consistently. And these included port authorities, shipping companies, all levels of government, as well as to a lesser degree, NGOs and businesses. These workshops were central to our research design because we came into this viewing the marine transportation system as a socio-technical system. We structured the workshops to explore and discuss a series of disruption scenarios with these participating organizations. Initially, we focused on relatively simple scenarios, such as disruption to a single important shipping route or using marine resources to evacuate an island. This was to help develop some common understanding amongst the participants of how the marine transport system operates, what some of its vulnerabilities are, what strategies might be useful in relation to various types of disruption, and what gaps there might be in planning. 
We then moved on to progressively more complicated scenarios, specifically a moderate earthquake and then a catastrophic one. We also did quite a bit of modeling of system disruption and community impacts. Um, broadly speaking, we developed various sub-models of different aspects of the system, including Model 1, damage to critical infrastructure, including marine transportation facilities, as well as ground transportation, staging areas, and utilities. This helped inform Model 3, community impacts. We also have Model 4, which looked at how shipping operations would be disrupted, and Model 6, which simulated different strategies for reducing community impacts, strategies such as prioritizing road clearing, or uh, supply distributions. Well, I don't have time to get into the details for each of these. I did want to give you a sense of the effort by showing some example results. And I'll also come back to this community impact part. Here are some examples of our results, specifically for one possible case of a magnitude nine Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. On the left, you can see that my collaborators modeled disruption to ferry services, as well as other types of ships, such as barges, that are used for cargo transport and that can access communities that don't have ferry terminals. Note that the metric here is in terms of duration of delay for different routes. So that's a measure of system services provision and operability. On the right, you can see that we also estimated the functionality of other types of critical infrastructure that communities require, such as roads and utility lifelines. Again, the metrics here relate to services provision. Roads are passable or not passable, and utilities are in terms of percent of customers without service. We also had estimates of other types of earthquake damage and disruption, such as casualties, building damage, and so on. Uh, some of these are standard metrics of damage and disruption, but the innovations here had to do with modeling the regional transport network in some detail, and then considering all of these factors together. Our approach to assessing community impacts was guided by the purpose of the analysis, which was to consider from a regional perspective, how would different communities, that is different cities and towns, be affected by regional transportation disruption? And where across the region might assistance be most needed? These are the kinds of questions that a provincial emergency management authority would be interested in, because in a catastrophe, the provincial government may need to prioritize and strategically allocate limited resources for assistance. So our analytical approach here assessed community impacts according to a relative scale, lowest to highest impact, as you can see in the map. And in assessing community impacts, we integrated three broad factors, transportation disruption, non-transportation disruption, for example, building damage and casualties, and the capacity of the community to handle the disruption. For transport disruption for each community, uh, we consider damage to nearby port and harbor facilities, as well as damage to access roads and the degree to which the community is dependent on marine transportation, for example, whether it's on an island. In other words, we looked at whether the community could be reached by boat and the degree to which roads could serve as an alternative mode to marine. Note that we only consider transport access to each community, not transportation conditions within each community. For non-transportation disruption, we considered general building damage, displaced populations, casualties, utility service disruptions, and economic disruption. For capacity to handle disruption, we considered socioeconomic vulnerability factors, emergency preparedness, and local government resources. We thus approached community impacts quite comprehensively, although with a simplified methodology. And the key point here is that we assessed impacts from regional transportation disruption in the context of other factors influencing community impacts. In summary then, I think key concepts in the infrastructure resilience framework do generally apply to regional transportation systems. And I think it is useful to think of regional transportation as a socio-technical system, providing services and with alternative ways of providing services if normal modes are temporarily lost. I've demonstrated one approach to assessing socioeconomic impact in which regional transportation disruption is considered in the context of many other factors. It is complex, and even though we cannot analyze all of this complexity in great detail,
I believe it's important to strive for informative approximations to support planning and decision-making. Thank you for your attention.